Hi everyone. Today I am going to do a presentation on Believe is Prophets and the title is taken from 2 Chronicles 2020 which is Believe is Prophets so shall ye prosper. Before we begin let us join together in prayer. Father in heaven we ask that you please forgive us from all our sins cleanse us by the blood of Jesus Christ. We ask that you please open our hearts and minds to your wonderful truths contained in your word. Lord, please help us to understand it, to believe it, and to apply it to our lives. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. The scripture reading for today is found in John 14, 29. And it reads, And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, you might believe. In the Old and New Testaments, we find that God has called prophets. They were to be messengers of the Lord to the people. Paul said, But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. That's in 1 Corinthians 14, 3. Now, there are well-known prophets in the Old Testament, such as Moses, Elijah, Jeremiah, Jonah, etc. Are there prophets in the New Covenant? Amazingly, many people today believe that the gift of prophecy ended at the cross when Jesus died. But that is not biblical, though. And here's why I say this. If we look at a uh, prophecy in Joel 2.28, it reads, And it shall come to pass afterward that, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And you can see part of its fulfillment uh, being found in Acts 2 verse 17. And also in, if we read in Acts 15.32, we find... Uh, the mention of prophets and Judas and Silas being prophets also themselves exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them so this was after the cross this gift is for God's last days church Paul has stated that we will have prophets to the end to all come in the unity of the faith and he wrote in Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 to 14 and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith. And that's an important part here. And of the knowledge of the Son of God and to a perfect man and to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So here, things like the gift of prophecy are given to keep us on the straight and narrow path in accordance to the word of God. John the Beloved wrote important prophecies in the book of Revelation. Here's what he wrote in regards to God's remnant church in the last days. In Revelation 12, verse 17, he wrote, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. What is this testimony of Jesus? Later in Revelation 19.10, it says, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So the spirit of prophecy is a gift that God's church can be identified identified by in these last days. God declares that which is not yet done. In Isaiah 46 verses 9 and 10 it tells us, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. And in Amos 3, 7, surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. With these texts in mind, 
we know that God works through his prophets to declare important things that he wants his people to know about. Seventh-day Adventists recognize this gift of prophecy as being manifested in the life and ministry of Ellen White. She had over 2,000 visions and has written many books and letters. Her writings are an authoritative source of truth according to the SDA Fundamental Relief Number 18. Ellen White described her writings as a lesser light that pointed uh, people to the greater light, which is the Bible. What has God shown her? God has shown her the dangers of flesh foods in our diet and the harm that they do to our bodies. God has shown that we are most benefited by the original diet of man, such as fruit, uh, vegetables, nuts and grains. Studies today show that Ellen White was right about diet. In fact, Seventh-day Adventists are amongst the healthiest people and live longer than average. And here's a, a little piece from the express.co.uk. Uh, the reason as to why vegans and vegetarians live longer could be due to the following. Lowers blood pressure, lowers incidence of heart disease, lowers overall cancer incidences, lowers risk of developing diabetes, having healthier gut profiles with a reduced abundance of pathogenic gut bacteria and greater abundance of protective species. So that's uh, all very positive things there. Now another amazing statement by Ellen White is this, and we can see for ourselves that it's very true. It will not be long until animal food will be discarded by many besides Seventh-day Adventists. So we see that uh, what Ellen White has said here has come to pass. Today, vegetarianism and veganism has become very popular amongst people besides Seventh-day Adventists. So with both the scientific uh, confirmations and others joining in with healthy living, here we can see how God has shown Ellen White something ahead of time. Another thing that Ellen White was shown was in regards to the uh, investigative judgment that's taking place. God has shown Ellen White in vision what is taking place right now in heaven's sanctuary since the time of 1844, which is uh, when the 2,300 uh, days uh, came, to a, it came to its conclusion and the cleansing of the sanctuary began. That can be found in Daniel 8. 14. Jesus' heavenly ministry has moved from the holy place to the most holy place in heaven's sanctuary. This begins the last phase of his mediation there, which can also be referred to as the Day of Atonement. This work is part of the final warning message to mankind, as found in Revelation 14.7, where it says that the judgment is come. Another important uh, part of Ellen White's ministries is that the foundations of the faith was confirmed through her visions. Uh, we'll just read through all this together and I've underlined the important part that we need to take note of. Many of our people do not realize how firmly the foundation of our faith has been laid. My husband, Elder Joseph Bates, Father Pierce, Elder Hiram Edson, and others who were keen, noble and true were among those who, after passing the time in 1844, searched for the truth as for hidden treasure. I met with them and we studied and prayed earnestly. Often we remained together until late at night and sometimes through the entire night, praying for light and studying the word. Again and again, these brethren came together to study the Bible in order that they might know its meaning and be prepared to teach it with power. When they, come, when they came to the point in their study where they said, we can do nothing more, the Spirit of the Lord would come upon me. I would be taken off in vision and a clear explanation of the passages we had been studying would be given me with instruction as to how we were to labor and teach effectively. Thus, light was given that helped us to understand the, script, the scriptures in regard to Christ, his mission and his priesthood 
a line of truth extending from that time to the time when we shall, we shall enter the city of God was made plain to me, and I gave to others the instruction that the Lord had given me. As Seventh-day Adventists, we accept that the Bible is our only creed. As a way of showing what we believe from the Bible, we have 28 fundamental, uh, fundamental beliefs explaining the doctrines that we believe as Seventh-day Adventists. They are key beliefs that every Seventh-day Adventist ought to believe and teach in these last days, as unity in our message is essential for an effective proclamation of the three angels' messages. If you don't believe things like the Seventh-day Sabbath, then there's little point in being a Seventh-day Adventist, right? You know, it's in our very name. And if you want to learn more about our beliefs, you know, you can check out the website, Adventist.uk, and look up the section in regards to our fundamental beliefs. What do God's prophets say about the sanctuary? God instructed Moses in regards to the building of the sanctuary. You can find that in Exodus 25, and the key part is verses 8 and 9. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, according to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. And uh, this um, picture here, this diagram basically shows you how it basically would have looked and how it was laid out. You've got your entrance, and you've got your um, altar of burnt offering, the laver. Um, then you've got your inner court where you've got your table of showbread, candlestick, and altar of incense. And then the most holy, you've got your Ark of the Covenant. And uh, we've got some text here. It helps to explain a little bit about uh, some of the furniture. This is the laver. Thou shalt also make a laver of brass, and his foot also of brass, to wash withal. And thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt put water therein. For Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and their feet thereat. When they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water, that they die not. For when they come near to the altar to minister, to burn offering made by fire unto the, unto the Lord, so shall they wash their hands and their feet, that they die not. And it shall be a statute for, the, for them forever to them, even to him and to his seed throughout their generations. So that's in Exodus 30, verses 18 to 21. Exodus 38, verse 8, tells us that it was made of looking glasses, indicating that it is uh, reflective and will show the priests their reflection. And that is quite significant if we consider the fact that we need to be uh, stainless or, you know, we need to be cleansed of our sins. And the altar of burnt offering, it says in Exodus 38 verses 1 to 7, And he made the altar of burnt offering of shittim wood, five cubits was the length thereof, and five cubits the breadth thereof. It was four square and three cubits the height thereof. And he made the horns thereof on the, on the four corners of it. The horns thereof were of the same, and he overlaid it with brass. And he made all the vessels of the altar, the pots and the shovels and the basins and the flesh hooks and the fire pans, all the vessels thereof he made of brass. And he made for the altar a brass and grate of network uh, under the compass uh, thereof beneath unto the midst of it. And he cast four rings for the four ends of the grate of brass to be places for the staves. And he made the staves of shit and wood, and overlaid them with brass. And he put the staves into the rings on the sides of the altar, to bear it withal. He made the altar hollow with boards. In the inner court of the sanctuary, uh, we can read in Exodus 40, verses uh, 3 to 5, And thou shalt put therein the ark of the testimony, and cover the ark with the veil. And thou shalt bring in the table, and set in order the things that are to be set in order upon it. And thou shalt bring in the candlestick and light the lamps thereof, and thou shalt put and thou shalt set the altar of gold for the incense before the ark of the testimony, and put the hanging of the door to the tabernacle. So this is basically how it would appear. You've got your your veil separating the ark from uh, 
the rest of the furniture in the inner court, the, uh, the altar of incense, candlestick, and the table of showbread. And here's a short video that uh, will basically take you through the sanctuary. During the Israelites' captivity in Egypt, they mixed a great deal of paganism with the truth of God. It was therefore necessary and important for God to teach them His truth and His commandments all over again. So Moses climbed the mountain and received two tables of stone, upon which God had written His Ten Commandments with His own finger. This is the only thing we have on earth that God has written with His own finger. The only document from the Creator Himself. These ten words were called the testimony as it was God's testimony to the world. Beside the Ten Commandments, there was another covenant they entered into. And this covenant says if they were loyal to God, then He will choose them over the other nations. They also received civil laws to maintain law and order. And it's important to separate the commandments from the civil laws. The Ten Commandments is a universal law. Moses was directed to build a sanctuary. Everything that he was to build, he would build according to the design of the temple he was shown in heaven. The Ten Commandments, or the Testimony of God as it was called, was put into the ark. And on this ark there was a covering that was called the Mercy Seat. It was a place of atonement. After they built it, they placed the furniture in the positions God showed them. The altar of burnt offering symbolized the sacrifice of the coming Saviour. And the bronze laver that symbolized cleansing, or cleansing of baptism. And further on into the holy place, we have the table of showbread. With the bread that symbolized God's word, which we should eat. Here on the other side, we have the seven-branched candlestick that was a symbol of God's congregation and the oil that symbolized the spirit that God would send to his people. And further on, we have the altar of incense which symbolized the prayers of the faithful sending up to heaven. Then, in the most holy place, is the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Testimony that Moses was asked to make with the Ten Commandments inside. This symbolized that it was God's Ten Commandments that had been broken and demanded a blood sacrifice. The blood symbolized the Savior that would come and take the penalty for the people who had sinned against their Creator, breaking His commandments. Through the sanctuary, the Israelites were to preserve the meaning behind Jesus' mission to come and die for the world and preserve God's true commandments, the law that had been broken. The sanctuary also showed how mankind could again be reconciled to God but the children of Israel were somewhat reluctant to carry this responsibility, as the commandments would separate them from the rest of the world. As you would have seen in the video, you would have noticed that the appearance of the Ark was a bit different from how we would traditionally view it. According to Alan White, what we're seeing in basically in this picture here is roughly how we'd expect to see it. She wrote this. The cover of this sacred chest was the mercy seat, made of solid gold. On each end of the mercy seat was fixed a cherub of pure solid gold. Their faces were turned toward each other and were looking reverentially to, uh, downward toward the mercy seat which represents all the heavenly angels looking with interest and reverence to the law of God deposited in the ark in the heavenly sanctuary. These cherubs had wings. One wing of each angel was stretched forth on high, while the other wing of each angel covered their forms. The ark of the earthly sanctuary was the pattern of a true ark in heaven. There beside the heavenly ark stand living angels at either end of the ark. 
each with one wing overshadowing the mercy seat and stretching forth on high, while the other wings are folded over their forms in token of, of reverence and humility. So this picture is uh, one of the most accurate ones that you'll see out there in regards to the design of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, in regards to the layout of the sanctuary, traditionally, the layout of the sanctuary has been depicted, as you can see in the following picture. But is the traditional layout correct? I would say it's unlikely that the traditional depictions of the layout is correct, simply due to what we can read in the Bible. Firstly, when the high priest was to sprinkle the mercy seat with the blood of animals, he was instructed to do so in an eastward direction, which you can find in Leviticus 16, verses 14 and 15. This means that the traditional view of the high priest standing facing westwards, which would be away from the veil towards the ark, cannot be possible. Most likely the ark would have been placed facing in a southern direction with the blood of animals being sprinkled on the east side of the mercy seat which of course leaves a vacant western side and we'll get into why that's significant soon enough is god's throne on the north now it could be a possibility that the ark of the covenant was placed on the north side against the wall in the most holy place in Isaiah 14, 13, where it talks about Satan, it says, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. So Satan wants to be like God. And where does he want to have his throne? He wants to have it on the north. So it's interesting seeing that uh, the north has been linked to where God's throne is. Also in Ezekiel 1.4, we find another mention of the north. And I looked and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north. So it's, it's interesting. In this diagram, we can see basically how the sanctuary may have looked. Now we've got here the ark on the north wall in the most holy place facing southwards. Of course, in the video, it offers a, a possible other um, theory there where the Ark is more central in the most holy place, but still facing in a sovereign direction. Did Christ die facing in a sovereign direction? In John 19, 41, it reads, now in the place where he was crucified, that's Jesus, there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulchre, wherein was never man yet laid. In this text, we find that Jesus was crucified in this location where he was laid in the tomb. And in this photo, it shows what many believe to be the actual tomb of Jesus Christ, the garden tomb. In this area of the garden tomb, in between the place of the skull, or Golgotha, which is at the bus station, and the tomb itself, we have uh, a site where an excavation was done by Ronald Wyatt. And in this site, he found a crucifixion site. And here he found Roman cutouts that would have been for signs to be placed. And uh, it is believed that these signs would have been the ones that read Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, which would have been written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And you can see that in John 1920, the three languages. According to Ellen White, thousands were to be able to read the inscription of, um, of who Christ was. A higher power than Pilate or the Jews had directed the placing of that inscription above the head of Jesus. In the providence of God, it was to awaken thought 
an investigation of the scriptures, the place where Christ was crucified was near to the city. Thousands of people from all lands were then at Jerusalem, and the inscription declaring Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, would come to their notice. It was a living truth transcribed, tra transcribed by the hand that God had guided. You can see that in Zer of Ages. So thousands had to be able to read it. As you can see in the picture here, if thousands were walking past, they were not going to be able to read that sign properly on the cross because three languages squeezed together you just can't read it but three separate signs with bigger writing yeah now it can make sense at the crucifixion site uh, ron wyatt found four cross holes of course on the day when christ was crucified the one in the middle was most likely vacant since uh, one criminal at either side of Christ was crucified that day. Um, there was an altar stone sticking out of the extending out of the rear wall. Uh, the rolling stone from the garden tomb was also found there, but uh, that will, I believe, be shown one day in the future. This is a photo of the altar stone that was extending out of the rear wall. And uh, here's a video with Bill Fry talking about some of the artifacts, uh, which will be the, the cross hole plug and the stalactite that was found during the dig for the Ark of the Covenant. Are you videotaping this? I am, yeah. Okay, Thanks. good. Okay, what this is, is, it's a stalactite, which is approximately 11 to 12 inches long. And this was the stalactite that was hanging down in front of the chamber or the entrance into the chamber where Ron first entered and found the Ark of the Covenant. And he broke it off, and you can see where it's broken right here. If you can get that in the, in the proper light. You can see where it's broken off. He broke that off so that the little air boy that was with him could get into the chamber. And of course, I believe later, if I remember the story correctly, he had to enlarge the hole a little bit so he could get in. But this is the stalactite from that cave. Now tell us what this is. Let me put this over here. The seal stone that was in the cross hole that we believe held the cross of Christ. And they used these seal stones to plug the hole when it wasn't being used so that in between uses it wouldn't fill up with debris and everything because then you couldn't get anything in it. And a, and a 12 inch square hole would be very difficult to, to, uh, to dig the, the, uh, the debris and everything out. It was approximately about two, two and a half feet deep. I think it was 28 inches, something like that. Okay. So, so which way up? Was it this way up? Or I, believe, or this way up? I believe it was like this. And the reason I say that is because you can see uh, the seepage here. It was kind of a concretion where it was sitting like this in the moisture. On the bottom, but that's just a speculation on my part. I believe it was there like this. Okay. And it's twelve, approximately twelve inches by thirteen inches. It's not quite square. It's a little bit longer this way than it is that way. And that fit securely in the hole, so that the yeah. In fact, on the uh, video, you can see it sitting in the hole. Okay. I believe in one of the video shots. So the upright. Been for the cross, that's about the rough dimension that it would have been. Would have been approximately, yeah, probably, probably about 12 by 12. So, um, some interesting facts. At this site, we find that Jesus would have been crucified facing in a southwards direction. This brings to mind the fact that the Ark of the Covenant was also facing south. Remember, the Ark is God's throne on earth. Also, this site was a public road where many people would have walked by reading the signs, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, which is how it is possible that thousands could have read it that day. Every year on the Day of Atonement, God would have the sanctuary cleansed. In Leviticus 16, verses 14 to 16, it, it reads, and he shall take of the blood of the bullock, 
and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward, and before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle the blood with his finger seven times. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people, and bring his blood within the veil, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock, and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat, and before the mercy seat. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place, because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel, and because of their transgressions in all their sins. And so, and so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. When Christ died, the veil of the temple was torn. The veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place was torn in two when Jesus had shed his blood on the cross for our sins. It tells us this in Matthew 27, verses 50 to 53. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. So that's the veil here separating the ark from the other furniture here. That was the veil that was torn in two, revealing the ark to, to the most holy place. What does the tearing of the veil mean? Ellen White wrote that the crucifixion, as Jesus died on Calvary, he cried, it's finished. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. This was to show that the services of the earthly sanctuary were forever finished and that God would no more meet with them in their earthly temple to accept their sacrifices. In Hebrews 6, uh, verses 19 and 20, it says, Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner as for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In Hebrews <clears throat> in Hebrews 10, 19 21, having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God. According to Ellen White, there will be a new temple on earth. And this won't be in New Jerusalem, though, because the book of Revelation tells us there will be no temple in the city. But this is going to be out with the city. As we were traveling along, we met a company who also were gazing at the glories of the place. I noticed red as a border on their garments. Their crowns were brilliant. Their robes were pure white. As we greeted them, I asked Jesus who they were. He said they were martyrs that had been slain for him. With them was an innumerable company of little ones. They also had a hem of red on their garments. Mount Zion was just before us, and on the mount was a glorious temple, and about it were seven other mountains, on which grew roses and lilies. And I saw the little ones climb, or if they chose, use their little wings and fly to the top of the mountains and pluck the never-fading flowers. There were all kinds of trees around the temple to beautify the place, the box, the pine, the fir, the oil, the myrtle, the pomegranate, and the fig tree bowed down with the weight of its timely figs. These made the place all over glorious. And as we were about to enter the holy temple, Jesus raised his lovely voice and said, Only the 144,000 enter this place. And we shouted, Alleluia! This temple was supported by seven pillars, all of transparent gold, set with pearls most glorious. The wonderful things I there saw I cannot describe. Oh, that I could talk in the language of Canaan. Then could I tell a little of the glory of the better world. I saw there tables of stone in which the names of the 144,000 were engraved in letters of gold. After we beheld the glory of the temple, we went out and Jesus left us and went to the city. And that can be found in early writings, pages 18 and 19. With a temple on earth and in heaven, it would make sense that the temple furnishings would be incorporated in both of these temples. Now, a lot of people believe that the earthly ark has been lost or destroyed even forever. But this isn't what inspiration tells us. 
This means that it will be very likely that it will be part of the future temple on earth, which will be located outside of the New Jerusalem. So because of basically the fact that they are protected and preserved by God, there is going to be a purpose for, the, for them. Ellen White wrote in Prophets and Kings, on page 453, Among the righteous still in Jerusalem, to whom had been made plain the divine purpose, were some who determined to place beyond the reach of ruthless hands the sacred ark containing the tables of stone, in which had been traced the precepts of the Decalogue. This they did. With mourning and sadness they secreted the ark in a cave, where it was to be hidden from the people of Israel and Judah because of their sins, and was to be no more restored to them. That sacred ark is yet hidden. It has never been disturbed since it was secreted. In the sanctuary is seen the salvation of man. In Psalm 77, 13, it says, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? From the door of the sanctuary to the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, we can see the plan of redemption clearly taught by the services conducted inside this sanctuary. The most important occasion for making an atonement for man is that which took place in the Day of Atonement. The cleansing of our sins depended upon the, the shedding of the blood of the atonement being placed upon the mercy seat, and this was ultimately fulfilled by Jesus Christ. It was on the Day of Atonement that the sin offering goat was slain and its blood sprinkled upon the mercy seat. It was placed there to satisfy the claims of a broken law beneath that mercy seat, the Ten Commandments. It was only by the shedding of Christ's blood that had any real significant meaning, as these animal sacrifices were only types, pointing to Christ, who is the anti-type. In heaven today, Seventh-day Adventists recognize that, that Christ is performing a work of atonement in the heavenly sanctuary. We can see this work spoken of in Hebrews chapter 8 and 9. This work in heaven's sanctuary concerns the original Ark of the Covenant. Nell White speaks about this. Still bearing humanity, he ascended to heaven, triumphant and victorious. He has taken the blood of the atonement, sprinkled it upon the mercy seat and his own garments and blessed the people. Soon he will appear the second time to declare that there is no more sacrifice for sin. So literally, Christ has actually taken blood to the, uh, to the mercy seat in heaven, sanctuary. So here's chapter 8 of Hebrews, verses 1 to 5. It confirms that there is a sanctuary in heaven and that Christ is ministering there. It says, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set in the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. John also saw um, this work in heaven. In Revelation 4, 2 and 3 it says and after this after this i looked and behold a door was opened in heaven and the first voice which i heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me which said come up hither and i will show thee things which must ha must be hereafter and immediately i was in the spirit and behold a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne in revelation 11:19 it says and the temple of god was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail john was permitted to see inside the temple this latter text though indicates that mankind will see inside the most holy but not by sight but by faith and this is a prophecy that relates to what jesus is doing in heaven today uh, with the cleansing of his sanctuary 1844 The interesting thing is, as well, according to Ellen White, Heaven's Sanctuary still has a bail. And that, of course, is because there's a work still being done there. I was then shown 
what did take place in heaven as the prophetic periods ended in 1844. I saw that as the ministration of Jesus in the holy place ended, and he closed the door of that apartment, a great darkness settled upon those who had heard and had rejected the messages of Christ's coming, and they lost sight of him. Jesus then clothed himself with precious garments. Around the bottom of his robe was a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate. He had suspended from his shoulders a breastplate of curious work, and as he moved, it glittered like, like diamonds, magnifying letters which looked like names written or engraven upon the breastplate. After he was fully attired with something upon his head which looked like a crown, angels surrounded him, and in a flaming chariot he passed within the second veil. Now, according to Ellen White in the book The Great Controversy, this work is being done in reality. Such was the service performed unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, and what was done in type in the ministration of the earthly sanctuary is done in reality in the ministration of the heavenly sanctuary. After his ascension, our Saviour began his work as our high priest. Says Paul, Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Now, in regards to the torn veil on earth, there is even more to it. Let's have a read of what Ellen White has to say. Christ was nailed to the cross between the third and sixth hour, that is, between nine and twelve o'clock. In the afternoon he died. This was the hour of the evening sacrifice. Then the veil of the temple, that which hid God's glory from the view of the congregation of Israel, was rent in twain from top to bottom. Through Christ, the hidden glory of the Holy of Holies was to stand revealed. He had suffered death for every man, and by this offering the sons of men were to become the sons of God. With open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, believers in Christ were to be changed into the same image from glory to glory. The mercy seat, upon which the glory of God rested in the holiest of all, is opened to all who accept Christ as the propitiation for sin, and through its, that's the mercy seat, medium, they are brought into fellowship with God. The veil is rent, the partition walls broken down, the handwriting of ordinance is cancelled. By virtue of his blood, the enmity is abolished. Through faith in Christ, Jew and Gentile may partake of the living bread. So we've got a connection of three things here. The mercy seat, that's the, the earthly mercy seat. The veil being torn and the virtue of Christ's blood. So we've got these three connected here. The veil of the earthly temple has been torn, showing that it is by the blood of our Saviour that we have access to God's throne of grace. The blood of Jesus is living blood, offering life to the believer. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul, according to Leviticus 17.11. This blood forever bears witness on the mercy seat, declaring that an atonement has been made on the sinner's behalf. Both heaven and earth's arcs have a mercy seat and a law beneath it. Both are broken by mankind and both therefore require a blood atonement from Jesus Christ being our sin offering. When Jesus died, that veil was torn in two, signifying that no more blood atonement is required upon it. This blood atonement is proof of Christ's sacrifice for us, for all eternity, being in the earthly temple prophesied by Ellen White. The temple always, in scripture, was designed to house God's earthly throne. How did blood get on that mercy seat, the earthly mercy seat, I mean? The following video illustrates how this event occurred.
The earthquake that took place to open up the ground is mentioned in Matthew 27:51. It says, And behold, the veil of a temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. The blood and water pouring out of Jesus' side is mentioned in John 19:34. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and war. Both John and Ellen White explain the importance or significance of the blood and war that came forth from Christ's side. So, in 1 John chapter 5, verses 7 to 9, it reads, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is a witness of God which he have testified of his Son. So to, to bear witness is to give evidence or proof. According to Ellen White, it was the blood from his side that redeemed mankind. You can find this in the Great Controversy book, page 674. Says the prophet, beholding Christ in his glory, he had bright beams coming out of his side, and there was the hiding of his power. Habakkuk 3.4 in the margin. That pierced side whence, whence flowed the crimson stream that reconciled man to God. There is the Saviour's glory. There the hiding of his power. If we read also Daniel 9.24, uh, we'll find it talks about the anointing of the Most Holy. Uh, and we can, uh, we can compare that also to Exodus 26, verses 33 to 34. Uh, the Most Holy in Scripture only ever refers to the Most Holy of the sanctuary, never to a person. Ellen White here talks about the loud cry of the third angel and the simple means that God uh, uses. Unless those who can help in such and such place are aroused to a sense of their duty, they will not recognize the work of God when the loud cry of the third angel shall be heard. When light goes forth to lighten the earth, instead of coming up to the help of the Lord, they will want to bind about his work to meet their narrow ideas. Let me tell you that the Lord will work in this last work in a manner very much out of the common order of things and in a way that will be contrary to any human planning. There will be those among us who will always want to control the work of God, to dictate even what movements shall be made when the work goes forward under the direction of the angel who joins the third angel in the message to be given to the world. God will use ways and means by which it will be seen that he is taking the reins in his own hands. The workers will be surprised by the simple means that he will use to bring about and perfect his work of righteousness. We have hints of this simple means. The blood and the Ten Commandments coming forth will be seen as a strong witness for the truth in these last days, clearly showing that God is behind the three angels' messages of Revelation 14. Ellen White said that the tables of stone being unaltered means that nothing has changed. She wrote, And I saw that if God had changed the Sabbath from the seventh to the first day, he would have changed the writing of the Sabbath commandment written on the tables of stone. And you can find that in Early Writings, page 33. She has also written, But when the decree shall go forth enforcing the counterfeit Sabbath, and the loud cry of the third angel shall warn men against the worship of the beast and his image, the line will be clearly drawn between the false and the true, then those who still continue in transgression will receive the mark of the beast. So it's going to be made really clear, okay? Ellen White also says, And he, Christ, gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communion with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. Nothing written on those tables could be blotted out. The precious record of the law was placed in the Ark of the Testament and is still there, safely hidden from the human family. But in God's appointed time, he will bring forth these, that's the earthly copy, tables of stone, 
to be a testimony to all the world against the disregard of his commandments and against the idolatrous worship of a counterfeit Sabbath. So the revealing of God's Ten Commandments, the earthly copy, is going to be part of the loud cry being given to mankind, presented with the blood evidence of Christ's atonement for mankind. Now, with the work or any mission involving the Ark of the Covenant, there are always four angels. Ellen White wrote, Four heavenly angels always accompanied the Ark of God in all its journeyings to guard it from all danger and to fulfill any mission required of them in connection with the Ark. And you'll see why I shared this quote in a minute. This blood evidence proves that Jesus Christ died for us and, in fact, it proves who he uh, claimed to be in the Bible. You know, born of a virgin, died and resurrected for us, and died for our sins. In 1 Timothy 2 verses 5 and 6 it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified or evidence given in due time. And I believe we are coming upon that due time very soon. Now let's hear what Ron White has to say uh, about the blood. The fourth trip I made into this chamber, it was spotless. The furnishings were set in perfect order. The Ark of the Covenant, however, had been placed against the wall, the end of the cave. The end of the cave was a beautiful crystal radiating the colors of the rainbow. Now, I know New Age and all that goes in for rainbows, so do homosexuals and all of that. But God used it first, all right? It's around his throne, and it's around his earthly throne. Now, there's no veil in this setup, so it is the earthly, it's God's temple on earth, or his residence, where he once dwelt, and uh, anyway, when I found it like this, there were four young men standing in there, and I started to say, you know, what are you doing here, and I froze, I couldn't move, couldn't breathe, couldn't do anything, one of the people said, we are the four angels that have been taking care of the ark since Moses put the tables of stone in it, right? And they instructed me to set up my video camera with the tripod, aim it at the Ark of the Covenant, and they went over, lifted the mercy seat up. I don't know how heavy it is. I've never tried to lift it, but it's solid gold. And the angel said, take the tables of stone out of there. God wants everyone to see those. I took them out, all right? They put the mercy seat back down over the Ark of the Covenant. I backed away a little bit. The angel came, got the tables of stone, put them on a rock ledge inside the chamber. And I was then instructed to take a sample of the blood from the mercy seat, have that analyzed. And I did everything the angel told me to do. Real quickly, okay, uh, dried blood is dead blood. Everybody knows that, all right? They can test the blood of the pharaohs, the mummies of the pharaohs, all right? There's certain things they can do. They cannot get a chromosome count by any method I'm familiar with, all right? Things keep changing. I don't profess to know everything. However, there's no way I know that you can get a chromosome count out of dead blood. You can get a DNA and some other things, but not a chromosome count, all right? That's done by living white blood cells. Now then, first of all, in this analysis, I took the blood into a laboratory in Israel. I asked one of the people I work with in, in antiquities, where is a good laboratory that does reliable work? And they said, such and such, such and such. I took it. I just said, please examine this blood and tell me what you can tell me about it. All right? They said, well, look, we're going to reconstitute it. 
we're going to put it in normal saline and keep it at body temperature for 72 hours with uh, gentle swirling all right that's their business that's great I said now I want to be there when you check it out they said fine so I was back they checked it out I said now uh, they said it's human blood we can tell that they did whatever tests they need to do and then I said take some of the white blood cells and put them in a growth medium and keep them at body temperature for 48 hours and they said well that'll do no good because it's dead blood I said would you please do that for me and they said okay we'll do it so anyway I said I want to be there when you take it out and examine it so I was back there they took it out examined it under the microscope and the one technician called the other one over there and then they called the boss over there and they were talking Hebrew a mile a minute there for a little bit and they looked at me and they said Mr. Wyatt this human blood only has 24 chromosomes in it everybody else has 46 you see 23 from your mother 23 from your father 22 autosomes from your mother 22 autosomes from your father you get an X from your mother you may get an X or a Y from your father all right this blood had 23 chromosomes from the mother's side one Y chromosome only you see the ch child could not have developed if they hadn't had the autosomes from the mother. So all of his physical characteristics were determined by his mother's side of the family, her autosomes. His maleness was determined by this one Y that came from a source, not a human male. Then they said, this blood is alive. And then they said, whose blood is this? I said, it's the blood of your Messiah. And I assure you, those men's lives have changed. Friends, believe the Lord's prophets who wrote of these things and come to the foot of the cross today, placing your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So please let's end off with a word of prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, <coughs> thank you for this wonderful opportunity to be able to share and hear these wonderful truths. Father, please keep these things in our hearts and in our minds. Help us to consider these things prayerfully. And help us to um, have a burden of souls placed upon our hearts so we may desire to reach other people and bring them to the foot of the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray this prayer. Amen. <laughs>